call this meeting to order. We don't have a quorum. Way to go, Chris. <laughs> I didn't ask to not take the appointments. <laughs> I don't think we need to vote on anything until. Um, nope. Yeah. So maybe a couple of people shuff, shuffle in while we get started here. Um, we'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. Are there any announcements? Uh, yes, there is. I uh, would like to welcome Mr. Tom Ewart uh, to the Board of Park Commissioners. Um, right. Tom, we're happy to have you. Uh, representing District 6 and uh, Tom if you want to say anything the floor is yours uh, no, I'm glad to be here see what I can do absolutely happy to have you Troy anything I don't have anything. okay there's Alejo now we now we have a quorum correct let's get him sworn in he's been sworn <laughs> There we yeah, go. <laughs> Lovely. This is easy. Um, public comments, not uh, regarding the tree policy. We will um, get to you guys uh, under item three of continuation of prior business. Um, so if anybody has anything, I don't see anything on here outside of the tree policy. Okay. Um, minutes are. Not available for approval at this time, but as always, you can see the uh, video recording um, on the link provided in the agenda. Um, Nafsker Park, uh, turf project, Tim. Hello, good afternoon, thank you for having me. Um, so I am here to talk about the Navsker Park uh, artificial turf replacement. Um, as you can see uh, here over to the uh, right where my mouse is, um, that's where the, um, the living um, turf is right now. Uh, you see the artificial down here. We are, there are some issues with maintaining the turf. If you've been out there, you know it, it gets heavily used out there. Um, the foot traffic is, is heavy, which is which is great because we're seeing uh, people use the park, uh, but it is uh, wearing on the grass. So we have uh, CIP funding to help uh, extend the turf into this area um, to help increase the usability and the programming for the park. One of the uh, other issues is that, if you recall, the uh, Christmas tree is out there. Um, we have to dig up this area here to replace it. So coming up with a better uh, solution there will help save uh, staff time, uh, help make the park look nice. So uh, that one of our main things uh, or reasons for presenting here today is to uh, update you on uh, the general plans, some concepts, some ideas. Uh, we are at 50% uh, for the design right now. So please keep that in mind that some of the design may be tweaked here and there, but for the most part, we have an idea of where uh, we'd like to head, but want to get your feedback uh, on it. All right, let's see if I can zoom out here. Okay. All righty, so this is just a general example of where the turf would be. This is... Uh, if we kept, kind of kept everything as it generally is, but we'd have to add in some uh, planting areas uh, under the trees, the existing trees, because uh, we can't go in there and just add in uh, cells to help maintain them. They would, uh, they would struggle. Uh, they're growing really fast, and we really don't want to uh, hold them back. Um, so. The idea is to uh, keep them in some type of planting area. Uh, we've had conversations with Director Houtman. Uh, he's been uh, talking with users of the park and has uh, some feedback from the public about the park. And one thought is, is that we could make it uh, a bit more shady or a bit more usable for the park by adding in a couple trees. Uh, as you can see here to the uh, to the north of the existing trees we know that this area is heavily used right now 
Um, so adding in some seating areas, you know, making this configuration work while still holding on to the integrity of the design is something that we are focusing on. Our thought is, is that uh, creating this kind of elliptical shape would be uh, help use uh, the, the ground plane underneath while also maintaining the design language. We have talked with uh, the designer, the, one of the designers uh, of the original design uh, to help make sure that we are staying consistent with the, with the design language and making sure that we are not losing any, um, we're really holding the integrity of the design. Um, here in the audience, we have the, uh, the Garver team that will be helping us with this project and have helped develop these plans. So um, if you have any questions later, they are available. So uh, some, some general ideas here are um, just came, making the seating area underneath the existing. There's the ePay deck that is here to remain. Um, so again, the main purpose of this project is to replace the turf. But while we're doing that, it would be a good time if we are to make any other changes in the area about adding more trees to do that at this point in time. Uh, here on this slide, it provides a, a really good example of how shade works on the site. Uh, and the top areas uh, and one through three, you can see how the existing trees work uh, right now in the summertime. Um, there are some large uh, buildings to the west, but you can see it doesn't start to impact um, the site until about 5 p.m. Moving down to if we added new plantings in with 10 years, trying to see how they look uh, when they start to be more mature, more filled out, uh, they start to add a lot more shade to the site. They create a little bit of a um, established aesthetic to the site. You can see here that the trees will start to you know, get larger and, and, and grow more into the uh, turf area. This is the area right here where we would see some of the planting areas, the new planting. Now, one of the concerns that we had is how does it uh, relate to the existing businesses that are there? We want to create visibility through there uh, while not um, hampering any businesses, any uh, opportunities for them to uh, interact along Douglas visually. We feel that the trees through time will um, build up and create a sense of place here in the area. Uh, and the buildings that are there, all the businesses there have established already and they uh, many people know what's already there. The businesses that uh, are thriving are already doing so there. Um, one concern is that the um, trees may block a little bit, but that is um, something that we want to get your feedback on. Uh, but we do feel that adding to the, you know, the discussion on the tree policy, adding trees into the site would be beneficial. Uh, it starts to create more of an <coughs> urban canopy that I know we all are, are looking for. So um, I will stand for any questions if you have any. I have a question. Um, I often see, uh, I know we have a small dog park area, but I see a lot of dog owners use the grass for their dogs as well. Um, I don't know, I mean, have we, have we talked to the apartment people across this? I mean, because you have a series of apartments, a number of apartments around, and you have a fairly small dog hill. Um, how are we going to make sure that they're not necessarily using the turf where you'll have, you know what I mean? Like, because they're not using the turf right now, they're kind of sticking to the grass. I'll answer that. So we're definitely going to have to remind them, have some signage, which really kind of is difficult because they don't read signs. <laughs> we can put signs everywhere. But we need to talk to those folks and, and educate them and let them know. It, it should be happening that right now anyways. Um, so uh, yeah, that was one of our concerns as well. But we're in a situation where it's going to be a, either a dust bowl or a mud pit if we don't do something different. So um, <clears throat> the other part of it too is 
uh, making, I think part of them, part of the situation is maybe they don't want to go into the dog run. And so we need to also make that more appealing as well so they can take their dogs over there. That's probably another project that we need to work on. Any other questions? So a couple more comments. Um, when we went through the design, uh, gosh, it's been almost four years ago, there's a couple things we really wanted to do. We wanted to save as many trees as we possibly could, and that's why we wanted to put some more trees in, is to replace some of the trees that were declining that were removed. And so there was actually some trees that were, were removed from the, the original site uh, because they were, not being, they, were, they were declining so badly that we weren't able to save them. So <clears throat> this gives us an opportunity to put in some more trees, um, which is something I've always been wanting to do. Uh, the other item in regards to blocking signage or blocking views into the businesses, uh, they're already so far back right now. Um, a lot of people actually know what businesses are out there, and people nowadays are not looking at signs down the street. They're looking at this to find different businesses that they want. And so it's really important that um, obviously they're should be using their social media and all aspects that they can for marketing. Uh, as we move forward in the future, down the road, I'm, I'm anticipating that we're gonna see less and less emphasis on signage as people are needing to use this to get where they need to go and uh, get their messages out and, be, and do their marketing on social media or, or through electronic means on, on phones. So, um, by all means, we want to make sure those businesses are successful, and I think they are successful on their own, that, they, that all of them have been doing a great job of uh, bringing customers, and, and it has an impact on the park as well. So I'm not too worried about those sight lines going into businesses. Um, have the you other, talked to, sorry to interrupt, have you yeah. talked to some of the business owners there, like John Rolfe, um, Nick Esterline, what, what have, have their feedback been? positive. Even with the signage and issue? It's something we talked about a long time ago and actually the existing trees that are on the sidewalk um, that are in, in already in the sidewalk those have are, are blocking all of them as it is already so I guess like I mentioned earlier if, you, if you're really driving by you're not going to be able to see in there. Um, yeah I don't disagree with you I want to make sure that we've had conversations with those guys in there. Yeah. Um, and Tim mentioned that you got some feedback from the community. What does that look like? Yeah, more trees. Okay. <laughs> um, but beyond that, I think it's uh, opportunities to provide more shade, just gives us more opportunities to do more activities at that site. And um, as, as we're trying to do more programming on, on the weekends, Douglas is always really busy. So whenever we can uh, have a more buffer, uh, that always helps that sound barrier. So that, that's always helpful as well. But the bottom line is, um, <clears throat> when we did the design, uh, we, nobody could really agree on what was better, whether it was natural turf or whether it should be artificial grass. So we split it and um, we wanted to do an experiment and we found out that because of all the usage um, and the limited amount of time that we have for recovery for that grass, the limited amount of time that we have for irrigation, and the amount of chemicals that we would need to provide for that. Uh, artificial turf is probably the best answer to really developing quality programs there. So, yep. so what do you need from us today? Well, since you do have a quorum, I wasn't expecting a, a vote, but I would love to get a vote of support. Is the motion to uh, support the plan to add additional trees to the Nascar Park design? Is that what you need? And move forward with the artificial turf. Okay. Well, I would motion that we move forward with the uh, artificial turf and the addition of uh, additional trees to the existing space. That works. Try. I'll second that. We've got a motion and a second discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. And you said the, uh, Tim, you said the uh, design is at 50% right now? 
with Garver? Yes, that is okay. correct. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Am I missing something here? Oh, it's different. Go to uh, item number three, uh, tree policy update. So before we go, that Penny wasn't there a student that wanted to do a uh, quick presentation? Um, there, that was a different student, um, but there was. Uh, are you Amanda? I am. Okay, Amanda asked if she could speak as part of public comment on this policy. On the tree policy. On tree policy. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that was a different student. That was a, that was a different student. Okay. Different. okay. Very good. All right, we'll get started with this one. Very good. So with me, I have Adam Nevizal, uh, a fellow from the city manager's office. We've been working on a policy. Uh, first thought was, should we be doing some type of ordinance to protect trees? And we sat down and kind of really looked at how we we're doing things internally. And a lot of the questions and concerns that we, what we were doing internally was what was really driving a lot of concern across the community. Um, Several city projects had impacted some of our trees, <clears throat> and we really wanted to find a way to formalize a strong policy within our organization, the City of Wichita organization. Um, it doesn't just fall on the Parks and Recreation Department, but it falls on all of the departments across the city. Um, and so we really wanted to make sure that we were taking care of things in-house and providing a good foundation and providing leadership for the rest of the community before we start going into an ordinance. I am hoping and anticipating that our policy will have an impact on the county, and have an impact on other municipalities in this, in this county as well. Um, there's a lot of other counties nearby that are doing construction and that are doing uh, development within their own organization and that they have uh, had impacts on trees, had a lot of trees removed. So we really spent some time looking at how we compare to other cities. We spent a lot of time comparing what we do internally, and we wanted to put together a formal policy within the city to really address our concerns with trees. Um, one of the big things that's been coming out is that we've been removing more trees than, we, than what we've been planting. Uh, there's a deficiency, and it has an impact on our, on our canopy across the, the county. One of the reasons why there's more removals than there is actually planting, um, back in the 20s and 30s and 40s, uh, there was a huge initiative, a huge effort to plant tons and tons of trees within the city. Uh, the landscape prior to uh, Wichita being here was, it was a prairie. There was actually not many trees here whatsoever. But as we developed into a city, the idea of having not just trees, but quality trees here makes for um, a great city has all those great um, benefits such as um, relief from the heat, more shade, uh, retains, retention of water. There's just on and on and on good reasons, good, good reasons why to have trees. And, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on that because you guys all know that because you guys are, you guys care about parks, you guys care about trees. So um, right now we're seeing a lot of our trees decline, they're getting sick and unfortunately some of the times when that happens they become dangerous so we've been removing more trees than what we've actually been able to plant uh, and efforts and initiatives to try to come up with better ways of planting trees uh, purchasing trees are all things that our forestry department has been working on and now that we got a little bit more funding from council and we're hoping and continuing to ask for funding to put more trees in the ground that's something that we're going to be doing with council on a regular basis so um, how do we get here? We had a chance to spend some time uh, giving this feedback to several different committees. We met with uh, the MAPC Advanced Planning Committee. Obviously, we spoke with you guys. And there's more efforts to talk to actually more committees. We're taking this to the Sustainability Board. 
uh, at the beginning of May, is that correct? End of April. And then we're going to be working on a workshop, a workshop with council. Now, workshops are not places where we typically take items for a decision. It's for us to share the information with council, get their feedback, introduce uh, the topic. So there's still a lot of opportunities uh, within the next several months to be talking about a city policy, which has an impact on city operations. Uh, we also talked with some of the experts in the region that really help us with our operations, and we really wanted to find out uh, some different perspectives. And I think in the future, we're going to also be talking to different stakeholders. Um, right now, we do have the topic on our, I always get this wrong, um, the electronic uh, forum. Forum, thank you. Yes. So it's up on their forum. We've also sent a draft to this to several other stakeholders, um, including uh, Canopy ICT. Um, who has just developed. I'm really excited that they're on board of helping us and working with us. Um, I just learned about Canopy ICT about three weeks ago, and they are organizing to uh, help us with these endeavors. So another thing to think about as well as we're moving forward with this is that the majority of the Canopy is on private land. Uh, city property probably uh, it was about 15% of the total canopy across all the city of Wichita, um, or even throughout the whole county as well. So what we do uh, internally with the city of Wichita, I think is going to have a huge impact on the private sector, and that's why we want to be the good example and the drivers of that. Um, but it, uh, eventually, we're going to have to actually work with the private folks, and that could be private developers, it could be uh, homeowners, it could be business owners, a lot of other folks that we need to work on that I don't have authority over private property and we're going to have to work with them and encourage them to continue to plant trees so we can strengthen the canopy. So those are all big issues that we have going on. Um, Adam is going to go through a lot of these points of, of the details of the policy and how we came to them. Um, there's still a lot of room for improvement. Uh, we still have opportunities to talk to different people about um, where we're going with this, but we had to start somewhere. We had to create some kind of a baseline to work off of, and so that's where we're at now. So I'll pass this on to Adam, and uh, I'll be back when we're done to answer any questions. Thanks, Troy. Um, so yes, uh, my name is Adam Nebens all again. For the record, I work in the city manager's office, but I also have about three, four years in agroforestry and environmental conservation experience in AmeriCorps Peace Corps. So just a little bit of background as well, of not just working up on the 13th floor, but I do have a little bit of background with, with trees and whatnot. So a lot of what this policy is presenting, I feel like Troy highlighted a lot of the long-term goals for it, but just getting down into it, I'm just gonna dig into, give a 30,000 foot level of what this policy is gonna look like. So first off, this policy will apply to city development on city property and city right-of-ways. Um, as Troy said, that makes up about 15% of the area right now. We're really emphasizing that this will be a policy based solely on city projects. So when Public Works and Engineering brings forward a project, when Parks and Rec brings forward a project, if the fire department wants to do a project of building a new fire station, these projects will have to include this tree policy inside of it. So, uh, as you see on the chart on the right, we kind of came up with a little bit of how engineering kind of follows through with their projects on a regular basis. So when a project is agreed upon, they want to begin the development or the design of the project. Um, at about the 10% level of the design of plans, they go to the city council and the district advisory boards for approval, uh, where the idea and the concept and some initial drawings are approved of. At that point, moving forward from there, a tree survey will be uh, compiled uh, between 10 and 50% plans, uh, which at this point, uh, the city will be going to look and get health with the city arborist as well as city engineers. They will take into account uh, the, the health of the tree, the, uh, the DBH, what type of tree, among other things that are listed in the policy of what do they have to write down when they take this tree survey. Also during those plans, they will have to produce a tree canopy plan. 
that basically says is if a tree is being removed, why is it being removed? If a tree is being replaced, where is it going to be replaced? What type of tree is going to be replaced? What is the height, the circumference, the area? Kind of giving a real detailed layout as well as visual documentation. We want to show the public where the trees are going to be taken out, why they're going to be taken out, and where they're going to be replaced. So as I mentioned, there's going to be a tree survey involved. I'm losing my page here. So basically what I mentioned in that, it, all you see on this tree survey here is a list of about nine or ten things that are going to be included on the tree canopy plan as well as the tree survey. I'm not going to read each one out. But as mentioned, the kind of net buildable area that they will have to work with, what are the critical areas, what are the stormwater areas, because when you look at stormwater areas, we're not going to be able to always plant in some specific locations. Um, so places that have regional corridors and whatnot, you can't necessarily place a tree there, and I'll, I'll get into that a little bit further later. Um, and so, as I mentioned before, the tree survey and tree protection plan will have these statements describing how they will be intended and identified, and they will prepare recommendations on the plan, which will include the exact location and conditions of the trees, uh, the exact location, the site minimum tree density, which uh, I'll get into a little bit very briefly, the location, materials, dimensions, and layout of the protective barriers that will be used, as well as visual documentation, as I mentioned. So. A tree planting requirement, we're going to be establishing a tree density requirement. The tree density may consist of existing trees, replacement trees, or a combination of both. A uh, replacement tree requirement would be 30 units per acre. Now a unit tree unit um, is further defined in the policy that you have, however, um, each tree and the size, the diameter at breast height size will determine what, how much units one tree will be. And if you are replacing trees, they are worth a certain amount of units. So a deciduous tree that is about eight in, or about six inches in, in caliper size will be worth about 0.8 units. So as you can see, as you get up to 30 units, that'll be the requirement that there's going to be a certain amount of trees that are going to be replaced. If the number of trees is not enough to meet the minimum, 30 tree units, as I mentioned, a sufficient number of replacement trees shall be uh, planted at the minimum requirement. Now, the question that many of you might be thinking is, well, if we're working on a right-of-way, maybe the tree, you can't fit all the trees in that one area because there are stormwater tracks like ditches. Maybe there are regional corridors that you can't technically place a tree. So there is a provision in this policy that if a tree or the amount of trees cannot be suited in the area located, they will be substituted into an area decided upon by Troy and the park, uh, Parks and Rec and Forestry of multiple locations and where those trees can be substituted. So just an example, when we discuss with engineering about this, as you can see here, while I'm not an engineer and I cannot describe every color here and what those lines mean, on the right side you see that there's a possible four to five tree locations. Now, we don't know, I don't know exactly what the area of this project is supposed to be. I don't have that information on the top of my head. But say that this requirement, instead of four or five possible tree locations here, but the land requires 10 locations, 10 trees, we're able to substitute that into, say, Pawnee Prairie Park, because Troy has identified that there is locations and areas that we can move the trees into that area. So we want to emphasize that we are establishing this tree unit density that will be kept. So even if a tree is removed or a tree is substituted, you will be continuously seeing about, on average, 30 tree units per acre on every public city project. Another thing that this... Um, policy does is establish stricter penalties uh, monetarily wise for tree um, destruction. So penalties will be assessed for trees in the jurisdiction of the city of Wichita. Calculations will be based on the following four um, categories. Um, base value, cross-sectional area, the species classification, the condition rating, and the location rating. Without getting into too much detail, the policy goes in an Appendix B that explains each way that the city arborist will figure out how exactly that price is defined. The minimum value will be set at a standard fine of $200. Now, permits 
So say someone in their uh, someone in a right away of someone of a house wants to go and make edits to a tree because it's getting in the way on a typical right away, which we see a lot in the city. Permits for specified alterations of such trees issued by the city arborist or designee will mitigate these penalties, which is currently just what the city ordinance states. If a tree is damaged and does not require removal, assessment of a fine of not more than $200 will be assessed as well as per, per current statute. Um, in the statute, it actually also says that you can be imprisoned for up to 30 days, we are proposing removing that because we do not, I'm unsure about the necessity of imprisoning someone for 30 days. So um, on crime. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so regarding maintenance, planting, removal best practices, uh, the city of Wichita wants to promote the following standards as mentioned in the policy on how it removes trees and plants trees, as well as give reasoning and give explanation on exactly how the city is planting trees and how removing trees. So the public knows the best ways, the best practices through national standards, as well as understanding that if a contractor or a member of the city is not doing the correct maintenance and removal techniques to call us out so we can be accountable for ourselves. The city is not mandating that these private standard, that these occur on private property, rather just a promotion of best practices that the public remain aware of. And then finally, we want to include a heritage tree program. Many other cities have heritage tree programs. So this heritage tree program will be occurring on city and public trees. Uh, and any members of the public or the city can apply for these trees to be designated heritage trees. To receive this status, the size of the tree must exceed what is commonly found in the area for the species in terms of diameter or canopy spread, things like that. Once the tree is listed as a heritage tree, it requires an administrative variance from the director of park and rec to remove. Applications will be sent to the park and recreation director who will review and bring acceptable applications to you all, the park board of commissioners. And then the board here will have the discretion to determine if a specified tree can be deemed a heritage tree. Each heritage tree will all be added to the website, the city website, so the public can access the list of heritage trees and see where they can visit them. And so that kind of, again, is a 30,000 foot level. I'm happy and excited to take all questions and kind of get more into it. But what we are seeking from you all today is do you agree, approve of the philosophy of this policy? Are we starting off in the correct direction? What questions do you still have? And what feedback do you have on the policy? Where can we improve? Where can we get better? Where maybe there you have more concerns. So one of the things that we did when we started looking at this is what are the goals that we're trying to accomplish? And what are the issues that keep popping up? And one of them was the lack of notification. Um, and so this is going to be a policy that's going to be adhered to by all the departments, but primarily the people that are doing all of our construction projects. So this is going to, the, the tree survey is a huge component of that, making sure that we know what trees are being impacted and how they're being impacted, and we can hopefully make smarter decisions on how to take care of the, uh, the trees. I was going to say kids. Uh, take care of our trees. <coughs> um, the second part of it was uh, to see if we can find ulterior ways of protecting these trees. And if they're a heritage tree, uh, that gives us a little bit more clout. If it's a heritage tree, what are some things we can do to avoid removing it, but also how can we celebrate those trees? A lot of folks across the country, they have uh, heritage tree policies and they do great fun things with heritage trees, uh, but it's all about education. And it's another tool to really help us educate. And then lastly, if trees need to be removed, um, do we have a mechanism to replace them? Uh, mitigation is always a, a really important part of whenever we do construction and we do projects. Um, but we wanted to make sure that there's a smart way of replacing trees, and we might not be able to replace them in the exact same spot. Uh, what Adam gave a great example was a right of way that has all kinds of utilities in it, and a great part of planting a tree is planting it in the right spot, the right tree in the right spot. Uh, planting it underneath power lines, well that tree is going to get impacted once it gets a little bit older. Planting it in the right of way where there's a lot of utilities, uh, it's going to have an impact on the utilities and that might, we might lose a tree. So 
planting it smartly, finding the right place and the right tree and the right species as well. Um, forestry does a great job in regards to, and I think we've had this discussion before, um, using several different species of trees, so it's not just one species of tree. So when there is disease, like there is happening right now with all the pine trees, you're seeing all the pine trees turning brown. Um, there's other type of trees that can grow and take its place. Um, so there's a lot that goes into this. It's not just a matter of, hey, we need to plant a tree at this location. Um, so those are the things that we wanted to get done, those three goals. And I think this policy is a good start for that to happen. Um, Again, it's on forum, and uh, I don't expect you guys to have a lot of answers right now. Uh, you can think about it, have some time to come up, talk to folks about the, uh, the ideas, and you can always bring them back. You can email me, or you can call me, or we can talk about it at the next meeting. Um, but this is what we want to start doing, is having this conversation. So, but if you have any questions now, um, we'll be happy to take them. And then I think there's some public comment on this as well. Yeah, I, I've got a couple questions, but it can wait till after the public comment portion, um, unless there's something that's that it needs to immediately be addressed uh, right now from Troy or uh, Adam, then uh, feel free. But uh, yeah, we'll open it up to public comment right. for now. And uh, we'll go with uh, Amanda, you can start us off, and then we'll go Harold and Leon. If you could state. Uh, up here, please. Yeah. <laughs> you could state your name and if you're comfortable uh, sharing your address uh, for the record. Sure. My name's Amanda Mayflower, and I live at 1328 West 29th Street North. We purchased a wooded property there several years ago, so we have about two acres of woods um, that is along the Little Arkansas River. I purchased that property because I wanted the opportunity to protect trees. I see developers go in and cut down old trees all the time. And um, it's something that I've always felt very powerless about because how do I communicate to someone who is developing a property that this giant cottonwood tree that you're about to cut down is important to me? And that's one of my big concerns with this proposed tree policy. I think that you guys have done some really great initial research. I appreciate that you've looked at places um, other than Wichita and what their policies are and how they're approaching things. Um, I think that it's important though that any new development be included. I understand that new developments happen on private land, but a new development is different than um, something that's already established. For example, on my own property, I have a tree that isn't doing well. Um, it would be great for me to be able to use the parameters to say, okay, is this a tree that I should remove, is it not? It would be great to have some, you know, it's a hard decision to make for some people. Um, and I can see on a private residence that already has their property established, they've got their own thing going on, that this, a tree policy may not be as toothy for a homeowner. But for new development, there are established ecologies, and I've watched Wichita rip them apart time and time and time again. And it's possible to develop in thoughtful ways. Um, one of the things that I've really enjoyed living along the river is understanding water and storm water and how planting certain species in certain areas can actually slow down runoff, can actually create habitat. And I think of um, the Walmart on North, it's not Amadon, North Meridian, it's like 32nd Street or something like that way far north and they've got this drainage pond and it's a rectangular drainage pond, and it's dead. They don't allow anything to grow in it. We have a habit of mowing the big ditch, of mowing the creek beds, and really all we've gotta do is plant some elderberry bushes, plant some currants, plant some persimmons, and we don't have to mow it anymore. We don't have to spend that manpower and that extra money doing that kind of thing. You know, I really feel like developers owe us as citizens of Wichita because we give you tax money, we give you tax breaks so that you can continue to develop our city. I think development's great. People have got to have nice places to live and it's okay to, to take the time to do it thoughtfully. 
Um, I feel like any uh, policy that does not protect trees on public and newly developed land is not doing justice um, to the citizens of our city. Uh, Wichita citizens are stakeholders in how our resources are managed and it's unacceptable for the Parks Department to exclude us. Um, I think that the tree ordinance must be developed with transparency. I understand that each of the board members has different relationships to different organizations, different businesses within the community. Um, I think it was interesting and very telling to me when I found out that two of the members of the board are developers. And it made me wonder, when I've seen public park land go up for a proposed sell-off into the private sector, how their relationship to development didn't maybe influence the way that the policy was headed. So I've been watching this for years, and I'm, I'm thankful that there is going to be an open process, because I think we all, at the end of the day, want to do what's best for the people we care about and our portion of the community. And I want to make sure that every single one of us has, has a voice in this. I've said it before, and I'll say it again, I speak for the trees. I always will. And I'd rather do it in a polite public forum um, than than in other ways. So thank you for your time. Thanks, Amanda. <clears throat> Carol? Mr. President, members of the Board of Park Commissioners, thank you for allowing me to speak on this agenda item today. I have a number of concerns with the draft po tree policy that has been brought forward by the staff. Four of these concerns have to do with the content of the draft. A fifth and final concern is with the process in which it was developed. My request is that due to the seriousness of these concerns, this policy be sent back to staff and that a new committee be appointed to come up with a revised draft proposal. Having said that, I also want to say that there are a number of good things about this tree policy. Uh, for example, the fact that the city is in fact creating a policy is a, po is a positive development. It's too bad it's taken us so long, but it's a good thing that is happening. The Heritage Tree Program is a big plus and really opens the door to citizen involvement. And in fact, uh, I can think of several ways that I I think Camp ICT could be involved in, in helping the Park Department locate these heritage trees. Unfortunately, because of time limitations, I will have to focus on the flaws in the policy uh, rather than its positive features. One, a major flaw with the draft policy is that it only addresses trees on public rights of way and city properties such as parks it specifically exempts developments and projects on private property, even if the developers of these projects receive generous economic benefits from city government. While the Board of Park Commissioners does not have authority to regulate development on private property, the Board can recommend to the City Council that it address this issue. Moreover, other city boards, such as the Sustainability Integration Board, may do so as well. Developers and builders should be charged with designing projects so as to preserve and nurture our valuable existing mature trees in addition to planting young trees. Any time a business receives a public benefit, they should have an obligation to benefit the public. I think an issue can be raised here that the city needs a true tree ordinance that imposes obligations on developers as well as park department policy or city policy. My question is whether it makes sense to do one without including the other. In other words, does it make sense for us to go forward with this at this moment or to look at the issue more comprehensively and develop a tree ordinance as other cities have done. Another serious problem is with the penalties imposed on contractors and developers 
who either inadvertently or purposefully remove or destroy trees on public rights of way in the parks or on other city property, and that's on page eight. In my opinion, the minimum fine charge to the developer ought to be a mature tree's true value times the number of years it will take a newly planted tree to grow the diameter and height of the tree that is destroyed. Even more damning is that environmental issues are not considered in the valuation of trees. The draft proposes valuing existing mature trees according to five criteria, base value, cross-sectional area, species classification, condition rating, and location rating. It does not value trees according to their value in sequestering carbon, lowering costs for heating and cooling in adjacent buildings, reducing pollution, wildlife habitat, and lowering health care costs. The U.S. Forest Service and the non-governmental nonprofit organization iTrees have developed tools to quantify the value of trees taking the above into consideration, both individually and for an entire citywide canopy. These tools and consultation in their application are offered free of charge to municipalities. Another problem is that the city arborist or his designee may issue permits that mitigate penalties for violation of the policy. And it may be that it's the park director that, that can uh, issue permits. But in any case, at the very least, such permits or waivers should be issued very rarely and a record maintained in a digital file available for public inspection with a link to the file available on the Park and Recreation website. In other words, you could go to the website and you could see what waivers have been given and perhaps express your opinion about such waivers. Moreover, the penalties assessed are ridiculously low and may simply be incorporated into a project as a cost of doing business. In addition to any fines and costs levied under this policy, I recommend a three strikes and you're out policy governing offenders subject to escalation if the offense is more serious. The first offense would be a fine. The second offense would be suspension from doing business with the city of Wichita as developer, contractor, or subcontractor for a period of five years. This to apply to individuals as well as companies. The third offense would be permanent bar from doing business with the city. The fine should be at least the tree's true value, as stated above, times the number of years it will take a replacement tree to grow to the same size as the tree it replaces. The fine might also be a percentage of the value of the project. It should be enough to dissuade negligence, scoff laws, and those who might hope to save a few bucks by ignoring the law. Moreover, the cost of assessing a tree's true value the time spent by a city employee or a consulting arborist should also be included in determining the amount of the fine. And I want to make it clear, I, don't, I do believe that, that the criteria that are proposed in this uh, tree plan, I think those criteria should be used, but I think additional criteria should include the value of that tree in all the ways that I named. So I think that the, the way that trees are valued in this policy only partially represents their true value. Finally, I have a concern about the process that was used to develop the draft, and I believe the concern is serious enough that the draft should be sent back to staff with instructions that a new committee with different membership produce a new draft of the tree policy. They can work from this one, of course. My concern with the process is that while the committee included representatives of realtors, developers, builders, and downtown pro-development organizations, it did not include representatives of neighborhoods, environmentalists, or small businesses directly involved with planting, caring for, and removing trees. We are fortunate to have a number of trained, certified 
licensed and highly qualified arborist in Wichita, including consulting and master arborists. These individuals are also entrepreneurs who manage small businesses. They have a vast knowledge of topics under discussion and an interest in preserving, protecting, and expanding our tree canopy. Yet they were overlooked when this policy was drafted in favor of the aforementioned. Wichita's tree canopy is imperiled and strong action by this board and by the city council is needed to protect it. I request that this draft be sent back to staff with instructions to impanel a new, more representative committee. And that committee should be charged with developing a new draft addressing the concerns uh, citizens are raised here. Uh, I will stand for questions. I have copies of my statement, which includes on the back here, the, uh, there's an app for it, for calculating trees true. Uh, value in dollars and cents uh, with uh, iTree, and it's available through the U.S. Forest Service and, and this NGO, non-governmental organization. And I would recommend uh, considering that in, as an addition in valuing our trees. So I have copies here for everybody, including staff, and I'll, I'll leave them with the staff. Thanks, Harold. Leon. Good afternoon. Leon Mater, I'm at 967 North Back Bay Boulevard. I'm a real estate developer, real estate investor, general contractor. I'm here in none of those roles. I'm here to talk about the heritage trees. A lot of this, I think, started with a tree that stood in front of 967 North Back Bay Boulevard, a tree that would easily have met heritage requirements. It was safely 36-inch caliper. Um, could have been saved. Could have been saved if the effort would have put into it. Many years ago when I worked here in City Hall for the Urban Renewal Agency, took part in a week-long seminar put forth by the uh, National Park Service regarding historic preservation. One of the things I took away from that meeting was the concept that some of the gravest damage to historic properties is done by well-intentioned maintenance people. Picture, I remember it clearly, Paul Revere's home. They needed to get an extension cord across the room. 10 penny nailed driven into woodwork. Well-intentioned maintenance. That's what happened to the tree in front of my house. Very well-intentioned maintenance. A couple of other things I'm gonna, we need to really work on those old trees. I'm gonna pull off of that. Tree canopy, yes, very important. We lost one there. We lost another, we lost a huge amount of trees at Nasker Park. I take that rather personally. I was the project coordinator on the construction of that, working with larger than life Tommy Allen as the uh, director of parks at the time. Uh, John Fershing of Forest Street worked on the uh, design for it. I sat on the design staff and, and the construction. We lost a huge amount of trees there. Very, very small effort to replace them. Um, last, most important thing, and this is so easy for the city to work for, all they need to do is give you more money. Maintenance of existing properties owned by the city of Wichita. That's deplorable. The brand new stadium, last year, one year old plantings, I think they're destroyed. I think they're lost. Bermuda grass grew up through everything the exact same thing right outside this building. I see work going on outside the building now. I'm hoping something's happening to it. Old Town, I was there this weekend walking around. A tree, 16-inch caliper tree, when it was cut off long enough ago, the stump is almost completely rotted away. No replacement. Old Town's a huge example. Up and down Douglas, trees 
owned by the city of Wichita and planting beds owned by the city of Wichita let to just go to hell. Something that we need to do better about, I know you don't have enough money, beg for it. We'll support you. It's got to be done. Oh, last item. Has nothing to do with any of this other than it's trees and planting. You talked about developers and what developers don't do. Developers are required to do a certain amount of landscaping on arterial streets. We've done a lot. Required to be designed by a certified landscape architect. A lot of them done. My wife is a landscape architect. She's done lots of the planting. No one enforces it. There is zero enforcement done. I can drive you around town, we can hit 100 lots within an hour of required landscape plantings that have not been maintained. There is enforcement criteria in the code. There is penalties in the code. There is no one that has any authority that is designated to enforce that and to review it. I'd love to see it. Somebody, as a developer, I'd love to see it enforced. Probably I'll be the first one with a citation because the bush died. We're given 30 days to replant them though. And so it should work. That's basically the end of my rant. Uh, my heritage tree, it'll never come back. Thanks, Leon. <clears throat> there any questions for staff? Sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, it, it, is it Tim? Steve Howard. He may be on the sheet, but still not. Okay. Steve, come on up here. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for uh, not signing in. Let me speak. Uh, I'm Steve Howard. Uh, I, as uh, our dear friend uh, Troy just mentioned, I started Canopy ICT about three weeks ago. It's literally a Facebook group of people that are upset about trees. Um, I would like to tell you a story about why that's important to somebody that's in trees every day. But first, let me thank you all. Uh, when I was a young man, man uh, growing up in Wichita, my mother served as the president of this board for many years, helped start Botanica and a lot of other Nature Prairie Center, a lot of other neat things. I was raised by parents uh, who believed in civic service, believed in giving back, believed in pro bono con consulting for a lot of our nonprofits. And so I was really stamped with that. And so I appreciate what everybody does. I appreciate what staff does. I know it's not easy. And I've served as the noisy neighbor complaining. Um, and I know that's not enough either. Um, there's a part of this equation that are people, right? Citizens, they need to get off the sidelines, need to get involved. I spent all Saturday in a hot, windy parking lot at the workroom with a little booth for Canopy ICT just talking to people about trees. I've been just talking to people about trees for two weeks. I want to thank the parks director for coming by and talking to us about trees, right? It, this is an everybody problem, and it's going to require an everybody solution. The stark number that I keep hearing that didn't, hasn't been mentioned today is we're losing net 5,000 trees a year in this greater metropolitan area. Net 5,000 a year. Um, Gary, the Arbor staff, Troy's staff can only do so much. I mean, I think your forestry division has maybe been half staff once in the last 10 years. We just don't have resources at the city level. So my concern for the policy is right out of the gate, we're talking about 20% of the tree canopy. A tree doesn't know if it's on private or public land. It's part of tree canopy. We all live under it. It's a shared resource. You tell private developers every day in the building permit process what to do. Why are trees different? Why are trees not part of that? Austin did that. Austin created a permit office that everybody, general contractor or a little guy building a shed, goes into the same office, meets with the same people in the same process. Trees are part of that discussion. I actually like the intent of this policy and I appreciate the effort and I think it's a good start. I don't want to take away from that because it is. But right out of the gate, if we immediately carve out private development, of which I've got to kind of put a flag on the plate because two of the five people that advised this policy represented private development, but that's not the issue today. The issue is that's what we're going to start out of the gate. I can tell you, you will never get that conversation back. You will, you will get the behavior out of private developers that you incentivize. If you don't incentivize it, it won't get done. 
So I'd like to at least propose to staff and to you that a tree policy should affect publicly subsidized deals as well. The sheer reality is most of our development deals, especially in downtown, were publicly subsidized. We created a TIF in North Riverside, and what was the first thing that happened? That, was, that, that land north of Sim Park was literally clear cut to the edge of the river. Um, the, that suburban housing model that's now dropped on the banks of the Ark River, and there's about three trees right now, saplings is lower than your knee, that are planted. And I, I, I just guesstimated about 25 oak trees and cottonwood trees along the banks of the river lost on that one deal. Botanica parking lot, another great example. Uh, I'm saying the Vegas over under on those trees lasting is probably one year. I just think they were hurriedly planted. Um, they were planted because there was a public outcry about what happened at the botanical parking lot. So my point is time and time and time and time again, we've made public and private decisions that have affected the tree canopy. It's a critical resource. It's probably one of our great strengths here. Um, and I think we need to invest in it, right? So what I'm trying to do is not just come here and complain. I'm trying to say our canopy needs protection. It needs protection on public land and private land. It needs private developers, average citizens, it needs city and county all planting trees. We need to plant trees, and then we need to go plant a lot more trees, and then we need to create a career out of the people that take care of trees. Um, the story I was gonna get to is the one thing I didn't expect when I started Canopy. I mean, I, for a living, I create social media audiences for companies, so I did one for the trees. I have 500 people following us on Facebook. I have 200 volunteers. I got another 50 names on Saturday. People are upset about trees and they want to do something, but trees are a unifier. We can get people to plant trees. We can go raise money as Canopy and help Troy and Gary get more trees in the ground, right? So I want to be a partner. But I'm asking you to protect what we got. We have to play defense on what we got. If we're losing 5,000 trees a year, that's the number everybody needs to defend. Like, a, a well-intentioned policy that out of the gate only covers less than 20% of the land of our region is kind of doomed to only fix a small part of the problem. So we got to create, a, we, I, think we, I think we need an innovative and creative solution to something that's becoming a pretty big problem. And quite frankly, if you spend time driving through disadvantaged neighborhoods, you actually see even worse of a problem because they've been devoid of nature. So I'd like to work on that with you all. Um, I know everybody in this room has good intentions on it, but how we start dictates how we finish. And I think this policy needs more work to cover the whole tree canopy, which again doesn't obey property rights, right? It just falls victim to the decisions we make. And I think we all just need to really start making good decisions. And I think if we do, it can unify the people and get people into action over the next couple of years. So thank you for your time. Thanks, Steve. <clears throat> I think there's um, a couple of times it's been brought up about two of the five park board members being uh, developers or whatever. Um, I can assure you guys that um, everybody up here, um, you know, we just swore an oath today before this meeting um, to uphold and protect, um, you know, the rights of, of city parks and um, everybody up here on this, on this uh, panel um, does that um, each and every day. I think um, everybody has good intentions, as, as you mentioned, Steve. Um, I think conversations uh, should, should happen. I think this is a good start. Um, I'd like to hear some of your guys' uh, input and, and questions for staff. Uh, I think we got a lot of really good things going right now. I uh, appreciate everybody showing up today and, and sharing. So uh, with that, I'll open it up to questions, bring it back to the, to the panel here. And uh, anybody would like to start uh, for Troy or Adam? Sure, I, I want to address. Sure. So, Timing wise, in January, we were starting to think about how is this all going to work, right? What are we going to put together? So, we wanted to get some academics, we wanted to get some professionals in, in the community that know and have a little bit of background in regards to trees and, and development and, and the other things that go all along with it. So, we had five folks that we met with and we kind of talked to, and a couple of them have a little bit of input in regards to how things go in the development world. We wanted to find out from their perspective, how do they view this? Uh, to me, I think a good way to find out about 
how to get where you want to go is to find out where are all the obstacles. Um, they did not really have impact on how we drafted this policy. Uh, they gave us insight on what are going to be our impediments. Um, you know, to me, I, I, and, and I don't want to use this word. I'm not going to use the word, but I'm going to use it anyways. <laughs> and, and finding out what my enemy is, is doing and how they view it is going to help me get where I need to go. So we talked to them. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they had huge amount of influence on this policy. What it did give us was insight on what do they see, how do they see this. Um, and obviously the development community is very fearful because anytime that there's additional cost to them to doing business, there's an impact. Um, so uh, as we're looking at it, we're trying to figure out how can we move this forward, what's going to be the best way of doing this. From our perspective, from staff's perspective, what we have control over is our property. What we have control over from our organization is uh, how we do policies within our organization. Um, I'm hoping that's going to have a stronger impact as we move forward on other areas such as private property. Um, and, and I think you guys even mentioned it, uh, a couple of you guys mentioned it, without giving developers incentives on, on doing something to protect trees, on to, to actually planting more trees, it's not going to happen. Uh, they're looking at what's their bottom line. They're looking at how they're going to make money. Um, so I, I just wanted to share that with you because that was you know, a question that keeps coming up. Why did we have these uh, few folks part of a committee that we talked to? That's the reason why. I want to find out what the enemy and how the enemy thinks about this. I think that's a good strategy. Um, maybe uh, you guys don't, but I think it's, oh, you're shaking your head and you don't think so. Well, well, well and, and again, um, you know, this whole thing about you know, they're going to have impacts or uh, they're going to, I don't know, have, have impacts on, on, the, on the council members or how we do business and that kind of stuff. I really don't think so. I think it's important that we find out how they view this so we can manage around it and get to the goals that we need to get to. Um, you know, it, when we sat down and talked to these folks, they didn't say, oh, you have to do it this way to protect our interests. Actually, they kind of went the other direction and said, oh, we want to protect trees, but here's what you need to be watching out for. I, I just don't think anybody in the public can take that at face value, Troy. Well, the, the strategy is to take this to the public now, and that's why we're here, and that's why we wanted to talk to other stakeholders and get their input as well. Well, I'm glad you talked to the enemy first, so I appreciate it. <laughs> My point, well, forgive me for being rude, and maybe this is not the enemy. enemy. And maybe they're not the enemy. <laughs> I don't think anybody's the enemy. So I think making bad decisions costs our tree canopy, of which we all need to thrive and have a livable city. This is a source of pride. This is so you think it's a bad decision that we I know you feel that way. So you think it's a bad but, decision that we're, we're working with these folks to find out what's their concerns, what's their yeah, impediments? She was a developer that's directly benefited from public golf course deals over the last 15 years to get his opinion on tree policy before you even talk to your own sustainability board. No, that's not a good decision. Sorry. <laughs> I will say at the end of the day, the process yeah. isn't over. April 26 comes when we speak at the workshop to council. They're not voting to approve it. They're not voting to do anything. They're coming to speak to us. We're going to provide the feedback that we're hearing today. We will give the presentation on April 26 to council, and I've been taking notes on what every single person here has said today. I'm going to have on slides in this presentation another slide that says exactly what have we been hearing from the public. And the more people that come and talk to us and tell us and give us their opinion, on exactly what they believe the, the, the policy is. Speak to the council members, go out and speak to them, let your voice be heard, and let that be known if you think that. Because then maybe council will tell us then that needs to be added. So that's all I just have to add to that. And I think there's several good examples. Harold came up with a couple of really good examples that I really liked is that if there's a, uh, a permit that is approved for removal of the tree, that we actually document it. And, and I, we already do that, but we need to put it out in the public. Um, there are several other really good examples that I saw today, so that we're going to work into the document as a proposed to the ordinance. I'm sorry, to the policy. So, 
Um, Troy Alejo's got a yeah, question. Yeah, question, Troy. Yeah. Um, so we've said a few times already that, you know, we can't control private property, but um, I guess in your study of other policies around, I'm assuming we looked at other policies around the United States and other communities, right? Um, you know, it was brought up earlier, and I think it's a great point that, you know, we can't control what somebody's going to do on their own private property. But if somebody's receiving city government subsidies, whether it's tax abatements, whatever it may be, TIFs, whatever you want to call them, um, why wouldn't we include them in something like this, right? I mean, we have, there's other requirements that exist that they have to, you know, meet to, to be able to qualify for some of these benefits. Sure. Why so, isn't that, why, why isn't that included in it? But also, couldn't we just include it in I mean, it's just another line item on their budget thing, right? Like they include, I mean, there, there's other things that they have to think about right, that they have to uh, fulfill, other needs, other things that have to be fulfilled. So, I mean, what's another line? So to let you know, we have made that suggestion, um, and, and we're working with council and the city manager to see if we can put that in there, and then negotiating back and forth. Now, this is great input. This is great, because I could go back to the city manager and say, this was brought up several times. Who, uh, who, who are we, are we just negotiating with ourselves? I mean, because... You know what I mean? Like, yeah. do we want more trees or not as a city? Exactly. And I will add, that idea actually came from Camp BICT. Yeah. I watched their, their first video of the yeah. Facebook page. Once I saw that, I put that in and I proposed it. So. Mm -hmm. We don't want just more trees. We want the right kind of trees as well. I, I live exactly. up at North 53rd Street. And there's a lot of development over there. And they're all putting in eastern red cedars. And I know they're all going to be chewed up by bagworms in a few years. They're all going to dry out. And that's the wrong thing for those developers to put in right up there. Yeah. And that's the other thing is I see, I drive around right now, all the pears are blooming. And the pears are the worst thing we can do. And I know nobody's planting them anymore. But we've got to replace them. Right. And, and I agree. I think that's what I mentioned earlier was having the right, right tree at the right place. And you know, a good example is all the pine trees. Um, people still want to put in pine trees, but first of all, they have a, a pretty small lifespan uh, here in this area. And they're prone to disease. So why should we be pr planting them? Yeah, we want to put something together that's going to suggest what are the best trees. And I'll just add, uh, in this policy in Appendix A, it discussed uh, through K-State and their extension, uh, they say what the best trees for South Central Kansas are, and calorie pear is actually one of them. And the feedback was to take that, that tree out. Um, but yes, yeah, so all the trees in the policy are um, emphasized by K-State and their extension and what they recommend is good for this area. Right. I'm, I'm a master gardener. I do hotline Wednesday afternoon, so <laughs> you know, I know all about <laughs> <Yeah. about. laughs> And so from this feedback, we're going to make some adjustments in the draft, which hopefully will hold true when we get to the end. I have some questions. Um, hey, I wanted to first say thank you very much. I know how much you've hard, how, how hard you worked on this uh, to present this product. <clears throat> uh, I just have a few questions. And then uh, uh, a little more beyond that. Uh, first off, I saw the number 30 trees per acre. Is that just a, can you tell me where that standard comes from? Yeah, so over the nine cities that we looked at, which was Austin, um, oh gosh, now I'm going back to it. Uh, Austin, Fort Worth, um, Tulsa, Oklahoma City, Seattle, Kenmore, Washington. I have a bias there because I work there. Um, and one or two others. The, the generalized area, generalized amount that we saw around the median number was about 30 units per acre. It. Got it. Do we have a specific density that we're trying to reach? Do we have something that we're looking at in regard to density? Like that would be a standard that we'd want to get? I mean, beyond 30, I mean, I'm talking about a total number, say. Right. So I think one of the things that you've talked about and that yep. we want to incorporate is um, overhead maps of tree canopies. Um, one of the other items that's really kind of helpful with that tool would be a tool would be a tree inventory. Those are two really key items. Um, the tree canopy overview, we can get that from satellite, we can get that from other type of um, overhead viewing apparatuses. Um, but that doesn't really tell us the size of the tree. It doesn't tell us the type of tree. There's so much more information that we need to get. 
And that comes from a tree survey. And that would be a tree survey that we would do on public lands, mm -hmm. okay? So that's something that we've been asking for for many years. Um, David, it's been part of our wish list for- 2013, we asked the first time. Yeah. So I think now with this momentum is some more opportunities to ask for that. So from that, you can, from a tree survey, you can say, here's the type of trees we have, the number of trees, and gives us the condition of the trees, and here's what the goal is 10, from, 10 years from now, and 20 years from now, and 30 years from now. Here's where we want to go. So that's a, that's a tool that we could be used a tree inventory every 10 years. Extremely expensive. Uh, you don't necessarily go out there and inventory every single tree, but you take a sample, and that kind of gives us some, some direction of where we're going. Um, low tech would be, and it sounds funny saying low tech, would be satellite imagery of our, of our canopy. And part of this is not necessarily part of a policy, but it's part of a goal and direction that we want to go. And we could say something like, from uh, these particular uh, overhead views of our tree canopy, uh, this is what we want to, this is what we see now, and 10 years from now, 20 years and 30 years from now, those are gonna be the goals that we wanna go after. But the thing that about that is that um, a lot of that is on private land, okay? And it's really gonna be hard to sit down and go and carve this out. What impacts does the city of Wichita, our organization, have an impact on? Uh, development, future development, it could be, and I like these ideas and what we talked about, uh, and that's a whole different discussion to get past our policy, talking about an ordinance way down the road, or short time the road, depending on what, what the appetite is with council. But um, there's so many other factors, uh, residential homes, that changes every four or five years. I've, I've planted uh, five trees this just past year at my house, um, where before that I didn't have any trees planted in, in the previous five years. So it's really kind of interesting how, how we can really kind of accurately uh, depict on what the canopy looks like. What we're looking at right now is what was really kind of startling is really kind of eye-opening is we're losing more trees than the, what we're planting on public lands. And that would be something that I would like to also use as a tool, as a goal to say, we're gonna to try to reverse that. Again, a lot of that is because so many trees are getting towards the end of their life cycle. And um, at, back in the 20s and 30s, there was tons of trees that were planted. We haven't been able to plant that and keep up with that. Even if we were to plant um, twice as many trees as we are, are removing, um, we're still gonna be behind. It's gonna take a huge effort to do that. And as Steve had mentioned, um, money. Because <laughs> it's not just about putting a tree in the ground. And you want to make sure that you put it green side up, uh, which is a great tip for everybody. But it's the care and the watering. It's a, uh, um, you know, just because you plant it that year, and, and this is what was mentioned over at uh, the baseball stadium, are those trees being taken care of? And then not only that, there has to be constant pruning and care of it. Uh, when I was in Austin, we had a, a metric that we followed that um, a tree, one of our public trees, was pruned every, I think it was every seven years. So we actually went out and were able to actually touch every single tree that we maintain and operate um, every seven years. Here, if you ask Gary, I think that's probably every 30 years. So, uh, what's the difference? Equipment, staff, money. So those are all things that we're looking at. So that was a long answer to your question. Yes, and I, I just have a couple quick more. Just wanted to make sure somebody's following up on the, I asked a question about the 2017 geospatial study that was done. Has, is, is there any way that we could use that as a baseline for any future plans? I, I would just simply say that. And, I, and let me just kind of keep rattling through these. Um, uh, so, so when I was on the uh, call, I was told that, or that the call that we had that was talking about the first introduction of this draft policy, I was told now is not the time for my input. If I had been told now is my time for input, I would have told you, I think it's strategically a blunder to bifurcate public and private land right out the gate. Because I think what we're seeing 
is the biggest challenge we're going to have is ain't nothing going to work if we don't have public buy-in from day one. And if we've got, if, we, if we're coming out the gate tripping on it, it's, it's not going to end up being something that, I, I don't care how great the policy is, and I'm telling you, I like what we, I see so far. It's great, but just coming right out the gate, uh, I think it's, it's clear that we need to take another look at this, and, I, and I'm glad to hear that you're open to that. Um, on that note, I just wanted to make certain that it's, just to be clear, it sounds like you said that there were none, that, that neither were any demands made by private developers, nor were promises made or stipulations made that in, in a future ordinance with regard to private development, there were no promises made, and, and this is all tabula rasa. We're, we're still yet to focus on this. There's been no assurances. I can guarantee that, and I would, I would promise that till the day I die. Because gotcha. You're talking to some folks that really love trees. Yeah. Okay. And, and we are trying to get. Yes, I, I do. I, and you're shaking your head, but I love trees. I'm a tree hugger, and, and I, I've been working with trees uh, over 25 years in parks and recreation. I, I know the value of trees. I know how important they are. Now. When, when, we're, when we met with them, is to get more information, is to get a better understanding. There was, there was no promises given to them. What, what promises would, would we even be able to give to them? I can't give a promise. I don't even have the authority to do that. I understand. I, I, just, I just wanted to make certain that that question was asked just because if somebody says down the road, well, hey, this is, I mean, what I do see is we got a policy that, you know, basically in spirit looks like we're creating just this one set of rules. I just see, from my experience, when you have a policy that says this special group is dictating how this is coming out, it's not going to be received well. And I, and I think really... Um, well, to think about it, there was, there was two of them that we talked to. There was actually five in that committee, but you're talking about staff, another ten folks from staff. Uh, you're talking about this interaction with several different boards. You're yeah. talking about several interactions with several different other stakeholders. Sure. So, two people out of... Sure. Hundreds? I, I understand. I'm just talking about how the policy itself, you know, I, I, it was not my understanding from the outset that it was just going to be public land. I was, it was my understanding that we were going to come out from the very beginning and talk about a holistic policy. And I think that is and, one that's going to be more successful in the long term. I'll finish up and just say. Let, let me answer that really quick. Oh, sure, of course. And, and yes, I think the idea was that we wanted to do some kind of ordinance yeah. across sitting down and looking at what's going to be successful. Um, Everybody has their own viewpoint on how to, how to measure success and how to get to where we need to go. Uh, small measured steps, or do you, do you go for the home run? Um, two, different, two different philosophies. And what I can do from my perspective and what I have control over is going small measured steps to get where we need to go. Um, it's not the home run. Um, the home run is going to take Ten times as much work. Mm -hmm. um, I like to see where I can go and make sure that we are taking care of what I can take care of with my own organization. So, so just just to wrap up, and, and I'll just say as a comment again, this is this is really hard work, and to get this right, it's going to require you know a lot of people leaning in, and yeah, I mean like, there's there's opportunities for good stuff to happen. I think that that. What we're describing is a culture change in the city, and it's going to be a culture change inside City Hall, and we've got to recognize this is a problem for everybody. Every resident has something to gain from a, a healthier tree canopy. It's just, it's indisputable. So um, I, I want to, again, thank you for all the work that you've, you've done so far, uh, and, I, and I appreciate it. You're absolutely right about the culture change. Our, our organization has never seen this before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As we're talking to the folks that do projects, you know, they, they, there's going to be some work that we need to do internally. And if we have to do that internally, just think about what needs to happen outside our organization. Um, and again, this isn't just a forestry project. It's just not just a parks and recreation project. And it's not just a city of Wichita project. It's a whole community project. So th there's a lot of other areas that we can make impact on pushing this forward as well. And I, I always get frustrated because it always feels like we're the target and we're the ones to blame when we're actually pushing pushing the initiative forward. And, and I, I think if we are successful with this, it's going to be a huge change. Um, and I'm going to be excited about it. Adam has worked his butt off on this and, and we both have 
keen interest in seeing this be successful. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. What I'm what I'm gathering, what I'm hearing from you, Troy and Adam, is that um, this is just a, a baseline, kind of a start um, to get us going, and then we can um, make amendments as they come along to this pr proposal at any time. Well, we can definitely make changes to a policy anytime. Now, if we're looking at overreaching whiting ordinance, um, there's a lot of different levels to that. Um, you know, especially if we're working with developers, I, I think that's where the biggest concern is. And they have a lot of influence and a lot of impact on all of our um, daily lives here in Wichita on a lot of different levels. But just at, at the basic level of um, what Tom was talking about was having the right tree at the right place. Uh, you know, there's, there's dozens and dozens of folks that come talk to us about developers that are putting in new apartments or new housing developments. And yes, by, uh, by the ordinance, there's some things that they have to do in regards to landscaping. And they go out there and they find the cheapest tree, they put it in there and keep it alive for six months and, and then they walk away. Um, that, I can't say all of them do that, but uh, that, that's the feeling, that's the perception. And at the most basic level, that could be an ordinance that's in place um, for developers. Uh, it could be a whole lot more robust past that. Um, so there's a lot of different things. And, and you know, um, I'm willing and excited to carry the torch, but I can't do it by myself. I feel like there just needs to be more education as opposed to finger pointing. Um, you know, I, I heard everybody's problem, everybody's solution. Um, I like that. I believe in that. Um, there needs to be more communication. I think if this is a um, driver of that communication, I think that would help a lot. But it, it can't be a me against you or an enemy or whatever. I, I don't like that thought process. Mm -hmm. I think we're all Wichita's here. We want what's best. Um, you know, I don't think anybody wants to see uh, trees get torn down. Um, so I think if we can all come together and um, work together and, and educate everybody, um, you know, I think that would be a, a good solution. Um, and this sounds like is the, it's the first step in this process. St uh, Steve and Harold, uh, they're working on Campy ICT and there used to be another tree group that uh, when I first got here seven and a half years ago, <clears throat> was involved and we worked with them on several tree plantings. Um, but they kind of kind of fizzled out a little bit. When I was in Austin, there was a group called Tree Folks and I talk about them all the time. Uh, and, and if anybody ever wants to do some research on a great um, grassroots, nonprofit, tree supportive program, uh, they, they would come up with tons of grants for us. We did tons of tree plantings, but they were also very vocal and connected with council in introducing policies, which I got to work with them on several different policies. So um, I'm, I'm excited that Canopy ICT is moving forward, and there's a lot of things that we can do as we partner in the future. So. Well, I'm, I'm generally supportive of uh, what was put in front of us today. There's any other comments or uh, one final comment, and I, and I just is because I was hearing from from Leon over here. We do need to take pay special attention to enforcement and just make certain that as we draft this moving forward, that needs to be something that's taken very seriously. I just wanted to make certain because I heard you, Leon, and I, I, I I'm echoing your concern. There's paragraphs that line penalties up, mm -hmm. and no one in enforcement has any idea that there's actual penalties or that there is an enforcement paragraph into that. It's just, there's no one there, it's not done. Yeah, that, that's more in regards to staffing, training, expectations, um, working with, expectations. working with, expectations. with expectations. and working with uh, the developers that are actually putting that in place. Um, and, and it's across the board, it's, it's not just, um, again, I keep saying this, it's not just forestry, it's not just the Parks and Recreation Department, but it's all the departments working together on this policy. And it's all of Wichita working together in regards to the entire tree canopy. 
Well, this is also a national issue. I'll, I'll, in the distance, we have other things to go over, but the CEO of BlackRock says we are environmentalists because not because we're green, but because we're capitalists and we have fiduciary duties. So that is what I'm spending a good part of my time now is how do I fit environmentalism into the businesses that I support, right? Because our customers have told us we want to see greenhouse emissions cut. Uh, we want to see waste reduced um, because their owner are BlackRock, right? They're owned by investment firms. So this is not going to just become a tree thing. This is about sustainability as, as a community. And as your representative that goes to the sustainability committee, this is being talked about a lot. So it, by not asking developers to A, save trees, particularly since we're, they're going to be going into now in our communities because we are, have expanded ourselves to the periphery of the city as far as we can go without spilling over now into the neighborhood, you know, the neighbor communities, right? So that means they're going to come back internally to the neighborhood communities and now they have full grown trees to want to redevelop them. So where are the larger trees at? In the internal part of the city. So will we get to let them to rebuild a whole neighborhood and tear out every single tree? So I think we do need to include some of those developers in this. To take them out would defeat the purpose. I go back to that fiduciary duty because that's going to have, they're going to have to include some of those environmental things that they do for stormwater runoff and other things. This is one other piece that they're going to have to add to their list of things that are environmental requirements um, as part of development. Um, they, they have adjusted to the other things. Adding a tree into that I don't think is too much of a stretch. So. Okay. <clears throat> Anything else? Questions, comments? I would uh, move to receive and file this information um, so that you guys can uh, go to the workshop, if you say Thursday, next Thursday. That's the workshop, but, okay. and then and then we have sustainability board. I'm going to reach out to them to get their feedback individually as well, because I want to make sure that their voices are heard to the workshop as well. So I'll be reaching out to Nina Rasmussen, and hopefully she'll get that out to you guys as soon as possible. Yeah, I would move to receive and file this information. Second. We've got a motion and a second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for uh, sharing your time today and um, giving us your feedback. It's going to be critical and important moving forward. So, uh, finance update. Randy. I didn't have to make copies. Okay. <laughs> good. good afternoon, everybody. I'm Brandon Hall. I'm the new finance guy with the Parks and Recreation Department, um, freshly from Arts and Culture um, over at Century Two. So, uh, get to, glad to get to uh, make the transition and to help out with Troy. Um, let's see. So, this should be pretty quick. Uh, we're going to look at the revenues. This is going to be year to date um, for the first quarter. So all of these numbers are through uh, March 30th of this year. Um, just looking at revenues real quick. Um, we are on target uh, for um, for the budget, um, at least for park uh, for park maintenance and forestry. You do see um, for recreation. It's about 15%. We also have to remember that with recreation, most of our expenses and revenues are gonna be in the summer. Um, but what's also good to know is that over here, as compared to the same time, uh, time frame last year, we're about $200,000 more than what we did the first quarter um, in revenue side. And that's driven through by the uh, recreation uh, centers and by actually the tennis center. Um, 
So on the expense side, we are um, we're on par. Um, we're looking good on the expenses. Um, again, total overall, we are spending a little bit more than what we did um, at this time last year, but. Um, But you know, salaries go up, um, insurance goes up. Um, a lot of what we do is people, so people costs are going to be going up every year. Um, so that's why that year over year number is, is a little bit higher. It's not that much higher. And then our uh, percent of budget, um, I'm pretty comfortable with the 16% knowing that um, more of our expenditures are going to be um, more realized in the second and third quarters as we run into the run into swim, swimming pools and that kind of thing. Looking at cost recovery, um, looks like we're hitting pretty good on our goals. Um, I'm liking where we're at uh, compared to this time of last year. Um, and of course, we have not opened up swimming pools or the summer camps, so. Um, rec centers are doing better. Um, I think we can do a good job of hitting that 35 to 50%. Um, these are total, um, the 2021 numbers is what we finished 2021 with of cost recovery. It's not the same um, like the first quarter. So they're not quite apples to apples there, but uh, it looks like we're doing a pretty good start. As far as golf, um, I do not have a breakout by each golf course yet. Um, that is something I'm going to be, uh, to be adding in these presentations as we keep going forward. Uh, breakout by by golf course. Um, this 2022 number is um, the first quarter number, so um, or this 2021 number. So we are making more revenue from this time last year, and we all know that 2021 was a good year. So we're on par to keep to keep moving forward with that. Um, expenses are a little bit more, but you know. I, Expenses are just more every year. You know, like every year you're going to spend a little bit more. Um, so we do have a pretty good 1.2 million in unencumbered cash on our fund level. And with that, I'll ask, I'll stand for any questions. Any questions? You had shown a little bit that expenses had gone up from 2021, um, is this, I mean, is it just because we're hiring more people, like we're filling those roles, those vacancies? Part of that is, okay. um, there is actually in the recreation, um, $30,000 of this of, from year to year is that we spent $30,000, uh, paid that to the Great, to the um, Great Plains Nature Center mm -hmm. this month Last year we paid it in, the, in April, so I mean it's it's, sure. it's kind of that timing issue. Okay. So you may have you may see sure. some fluctuations in that. And you may not be able to answer it, but Troy, man, maybe this is for another area. But do we? I know in previous years, especially following COVID, we had a lot of vacancies. Um, what is a, what are those looking like? <laughs> We want you to come work for us. I don't think I'm talented. <laughs> <laughs> We're actually uh, doing really well filling vacancies. Um, <clears throat> at the end of the year last year, we had several vacancies that we were able to fill with um, staff from Century Two. Mm -hmm. Brandon's a perfect example. Uh, mm -hmm. We have four that uh, in the administrative area that's been huge. It's just been a great transition. Um, if you remember, Katie Dawes was mm -hmm. taking care of Navsker Park, but now we have Kay um, Sears. And, and so that's been a huge boost. Um, actually, what Katie was doing, I actually have two st staff members doing what she was doing just by herself. Now, she was a superwoman, but uh, having two folks doing this just makes us more efficient and gives us more potential for doing more w work. Uh, out in um, golf, we are definitely moving forward with filling those positions. Uh, I think we made an offer to one of the assistant golf pros, and this is part of the, the golf sure. discussion later on. But um, we've had interviews past week with several of the groundskeepers, 
one of the superintendents. We've had a couple interviews and we're gonna hopefully make a offer soon for one of the superintendents. Um, so yes, there's, I'm gonna talk more about that when we get to golf. But yeah, those are all some, some of the positions that are being filled. David is filling some more positions out in the field as well. Um, so, and then we also have uh, Brian Hill's position to fill from aquatics. That position just closed today, or actually last night at 12 o'clock midnight. Um, but uh, I had a chance to look at those, and we have four finalists that we, or four, they're not finalists, four that we want to talk to, and hopefully turn them into finalists. So a lot of work is going in the fill-in positions, and another item that Brandon uh, didn't get a chance to talk to, but we were able to get a great cost of living increase. So we got a 4% rather than a 1.5%, and that's gonna have a huge impact on Sure. Obviously, all of our salaries. Mm -hmm. So, awesome. thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? But also tied with that was like um, one of the great things that happened this last year is that our insurance rates didn't go up, so our health insurance stayed pretty stable. So that's a shout out to the to the guys up in finance for keeping that pretty stable for us. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you. Communication update. So I don't think we had anything that was uh, in line to be sent to the city manager or to council. Um, I do have some items from golf advisory committee that, uh, that I'm moving to send to the city manager and to get more answers and clarification from council. Um, let's see, other than that, general communication, I don't have anything else to update. Social media? I don't have anything for social media today. Okay. Recreation. Uh, as uh, Brandon mentioned earlier, you can see that we're already getting pretty busy to heading into the summer time frame. We've already, uh, with our 22% cost recovery we had last year, we're at 29% through the first quarter of this year with some of the still restrictions that we have in place with some of the COVID guidelines that we have going into the summer time frame. But pretty busy with a lot of things that we have going on now. Spring break camp was really successful that we had at Boston Rec Center. Uh, we brought in uh, $2,000 for that week for the three or four camps that we offered there on site. It's a big uh, plus for those family members who look for activities during that spring break time frame to keep the kids active uh, when they're out of school. Uh, we're also looking forward to getting back in place with uh, our youth tech uh, program that we offered the last couple of summers. And due to some of the COVID restrictions there, we weren't able to continue the program last summer and we're re-implementing that again this year. Uh, part of the CIP funding that we received, we were able to do some uh, court improvements at some of the different places around the city. And uh, Boston was one of those that we were reporting to court there, putting in some new goals on that location, which would be a big asset for that community with some of those neighboring uh, apartment complex and things to keep those kids active doing something positive. Uh, Edgemore Rec Center was another one of those locations that we had our uh, spring break camp. Uh, we, over the last couple of years, we've had some limitations with that and those camps haven't made, but we did have Boston as well as uh, Linwood and Edgemore spring break camps that all made this year and we were at capacity that we had for each of those locations to be able to bring in some additional revenue that we hadn't gotten uh, in the last couple of years. So they generated about $1,320 for that particular camp to be able to uh, offer that to the community for the kids there on site. I uh, also did a pickleball con uh, tournament that was there on site, had three divisions that were both women, co-ed, and, and men. Uh, each of those uh, divisions had uh, about uh, six people on each of those teams and uh, brought in quite a bit of revenue with $40 per person for that. That's something that continues to grow a lot of participation there in that area and expanding to do some of the other things that we're doing at the Riverside Tennis Center that's coming up that I'll talk about a little bit later, as well as preparing for once we're getting ready to move forward with our pickleball complex that will be coming at South Lake in the near future. So Edgemore also uh, did an outdoor photography class that's there on site. So part of what we did during the COVID is looked at ways that we can get outdoors and continue to offer some of those programs and uh, expand them without having a limitation of being indoors with some of the 
uh, challenge the restrictions with space requirements there. So this was a new program that we brought on, uh, on board that we actually filled it with the 10 people that was required and had a wait list on it. Something that we'll continue to expand as we move forward with doing more activities there. So the tennis center has been really busy and that's a good uh, problem for us. We had uh, last year with our cost recovery, we had the highest cost recovery we had at that particular location and we we're actually back higher to pre-COVID numbers that we had in revenue there prior to 2019. So that's a big plus for us and we're building on that momentum as well. So we have one of our junior uh, players that was there was actually named our student of the year that did a, uh, a fundraiser there for uh, leukemia and Lymphomia Society that raised over $100,000 for participating in that camp. And we try to do a lot of those different things for two reasons, to be a good community partner, but it also gives exposure for our facility for people to come in and use it when they have other activities and planning our tournaments and things there on site. So we also brought on a pickleball instructor that's working specifically with growing our programs there. So one of the things that we did there at the Tennis Center that we did a lot of uh, open play and individual instruction and not a lot of league play. So with Noe who came on board for us, we've opened up some league for 50 year olds and above, has been willing, well received. And we're also planning now with him doing his first pickleball tournament that's gonna be taking place this summer as well that we're gonna be doing on a national level to try to bring people in from outside of the community. It will be a big economic uh, impactor as well to be able to get more people in the community using it and growing on that momentum for us to start planning for South Lake once we get that facility up and going as well. So one of the big things that we try to do there as well is to be a good, good partner with our local universities here. So for instance, Newman both plays all of their home games here at Riverside Tennis Center. We also brought in uh, schools from Pratt Community College, Southeastern Oklahoma State, as well as Northwest Missouri State that used the facility here. And once we went out and we did the renovations there, that was one of the stipulations that that made it more attractive for people to come here that we had a certain amount of outdoor courts that were available for us to use. We meet, were able to meet that threshold and now we have uh, that limit there that we can bring in more of these type of events and we'll see more and more of that growing as the COVID restrictions lessen. And with the revenue that we brought in last year, it was still taking into consideration that some of those tournaments that we would normally host to the school districts didn't take place on site because of their travel restrictions and things they had in place and we were still able to exceed those funding. So we're going into the summer anticipating that it's going to be quite a bit more as we go into the fall and to the spring as well for next year. So one of the big things you guys probably heard about uh, that we're building on is the season venue out at, uh, at Watson Park. Uh, we're getting pretty close to getting those uh, the certificate of occupancy on that, but we are having a big uh, a lot of interest for that particular uh, venue for using for weddings and other type of events for the community. And Troy mentioned earlier that we were able to bring on two people from Century 2 to help manage that process that Katie Dolls was doing previously. So we split those responsibility kind of in half and they support each other. Uh, Kay, who is now doing all of our programming in town at Napster and working with the WAVE and community requests to be able to activate that space. And then Isaac, who did special events for the entire city, is managing the process for the uh, uh, seasons venue and getting people in there so that we can actually start doing tours and things there at site as well as taking over our community facilities that were assigned to our rec directors as an additional responsibility that's going to transition over to that team where we can grow that as well and you'll notice earlier how much of a profit we were making uh, from the uh, report that Brandon made over 400 something percent on what our expenses were, that number would even grow more because we won't have that cost of having someone there who actually opened and closed the facility to be tied into our administrative costs with uh, people who are supporting that. And I want to give a big kudos as well to our accounting uh, team as well as our rec center directors. Uh, we reported before that we had gotten $290,000 from the CARES Act funding for the grant to do improvements with programs. We were just awarded uh, the third round of grants for that, where we'll have uh, $117,000 a month for the next nine months to spend on program and facility improvements for a total of uh, $1,053,000 that we'll have to make enhancements to our programs and facilities and non-matching funds grants that we can actually use to update us outside of our normal budget and CIP. So that's big for us and a lot to manage as well because Brendan and his team has to be able to make sure that we're 
accounting for those funds and they're being reported back appropriately. You have to, if you don't spend the funds, you have to return them. So we have a plan in place to be able to manage that process as well as uh, make sure we're spending on things that doesn't require us to have ongoing maintenance and board on, but uh, spends our programs and offerings that we offer to the community. So I'll stand for any questions you guys have any as well. Any questions for Reggie? I don't see any. Thank All you, right. man. Golf update. All right. <clears throat> so we're continuing to see uh, strong revenues. We're ahead of the curve uh, with strong revenues. I'm not going to go over the, uh, the rounds report. You guys can look at that yourselves. But um, March, we did see a lot of weather. We had snow and, and whatnot. So that kind of hurt us a little bit. But such a strong January and February gave us a lot of momentum moving forward. So I, I'm expecting uh, our number of rounds at the end of the year to be, be more than last year, which will be great. I think our revenue is going to be more than last year, which is going to be great. And it has to be because I'm bringing on more people. <laughs> so it's going to cost us more money. So uh, we're spending more money, uh, and that means we probably won't have as strong as an end of the year um, number in the black. I mean, we were over a million dollars last year. Now, I don't think we'll meet that much because we are bringing on more staff, and that's going to eat into that. Um, we're still waiting for some of the equipment that we bought last year. The Toro has been uh, horrible in regards to delivering their mowers uh, because of the supply chain issues. And unfortunately, they're the only ones that really kind of have the great uh, equipment that we really like and need. And so we're about ready to make another order. And unfortunately, I think it's going to be at least a year wait. So accepting that, um, I'm looking at trying to get the order in as soon as possible. That means we'll get it sooner than if I wait till later. Uh, if I was to cancel our order of the equipment that we have not received, that would put me back at the end of the line, and it just would be push us that much further back. Um, hiring, like I mentioned, we're, we're doing a lot of interviews, trying to get people on board. Uh, the golf director just closed last night at midnight, um, along with the, the aquatics. I'm going to change the, uh, from the aquatics manager, but I think we're going to change to aquatics director. Um, this gives it a little bit more uh, panage. But uh, um, the golf director position closed last night. I have not had a chance to look at that because we actually have HR doing the recruiting on that. We reached out to the PGA to help us uh, recruit that position. And I do believe, from my understanding, with some feedback from HR, I'm going to spend some time with them tomorrow. I think we have several out-of-state uh, applicants. And so we'll see how many of them they are. And uh, uh, we have some pretty quality uh, folks in-house as well. I don't know if they applied. So um, hopefully we have a good pool to interview and, and uh, bring into our, our fold. So um, we did talk about two items at the Golf Advisory Committee meeting, and one of them is increasing the cart fee by a dollar or a dollar fifty. Uh, we gave them some numbers on what that would look like, and, the, and, and we look, compared it to other golf courses, and we're definitely below or at the same, um, probably even, I, I would say, lower than almost all the golf courses for the value of what our golf carts are. But that increase would go into a replacement fund, not into the golf fund. So it would be something that we would put in maybe every two years, uh, re replenish 25% of the golf carts. And that way we have new golf carts coming in all the time. Right now I have no mechanism for replacing golf carts. Um, if they were to all disappear today, um, I have no mechanism to replace them. Uh, the other item we talked about was increasing the passes, and we gave a scenario of 5, 10, and 15 percent, and um, it doesn't yield us millions of dollars. It yields us uh, three or four hundred thousand dollars at five or ten percent, which in some regards is a lot of money, but actually covering all of our expenses. It, it's something that we probably need to do. And, and we know the value of those golf passes are way undervalued in regards to the money that we're bringing in. Somebody who is 
playing um, a lot of golf, uh, 60, 70 rounds a year, uh, 100 rounds, rounds a year. We have some folks that are playing 200 rounds a year. Uh, they are getting an exceptional, exceptional value of those passes. And I think it's time for us to recoup some of those costs. So um, we didn't have a quorum, so we weren't able to vote on it. I'm hoping we have a quorum next time, which reminds me, um, uh, I think we have a couple of vacancies. Um, is it yours that's yeah. vacant? So hopefully you can bring in somebody. Um, and I think uh, Mr. Palmer's uh, designee, Mr. Schordorf, I have not gotten an official letter, but apparently he shared that he was leaving uh, the Golf Advisory Committee with uh, Council Member Fry. So if that's the case, that would be another vacancy that we need to fill. Uh, but on top of all that, there's some discussion in regards to a different model for um, the Golf Advisory Committee. Uh, Council Member Fry called it a uh, golf governance group, and they would report directly to council um, and not to the park board. So uh, alleviate some of the layers. Uh, still being very much discussed at the council level. Uh, we'll see what they come up with, and, and we'll see how that works out. But until then, I'm operating uh, with the Golf Advisory Committee and operating as if you guys are the appointees of those positions as well. So um, that's about it for golf. Any questions on golf? Was there any feeling on, on what the increase might look like as far as, like, the interest among the Golf Advisory Board? Did they give any direction and say, hey, we expect... Because like that'd be my interest and support to know that mm -hmm. the the users understand. We talk about education. Mm -hmm. Why we're doing this? So I, I do. This is a discussion that we've had for a year and a half, and kept getting postponed until we have a decision in regards to our um, private management situation. Which, by the way, was great that we have a decision and things are really moving forward. We had a game plan and we're executing that. So. Um, so that part is going well also. Um, we didn't have a quorum, so we didn't have enough people to really have a really uh, deep discussion of it. Uh, there's a couple members that really feel that the prices should be ultra low and stay the way they are. Um, the idea is that we should be getting more memberships, uh, which I totally agree. Um, quantity is, is important, uh, but also having that right sweet spot. Uh, you don't want to charge too much, and you don't want to charge too little. Uh, you need to have the right sweet spot. And even um, at a 5% increase or 10% or increase, uh, we're talking literally $5 a month of difference. And these are people that are playing hundreds of rounds of golf. So um, the value will still be there. They'll still have an ultra, ultra great value. So uh, when we have a quorum, we'll have more discussion of it. I, I do believe a lot of the golfers admit that, uh, especially those that are playing hundreds of golf, uh, hundreds of rounds of golf a year, that are paying uh, three, four, five dollars, even six dollars a round, is a huge, huge value. Um, uh, if I had the time, I'd be playing 200 rounds of golf as well at two bucks a round. Cool. So um, more to come on that. Troy, your proposed increase, would it go for all the memberships of the adult, the couple, junior, senior? That's yet to be discussed, but um, where the most, where the greatest value right now and we're losing the most money is the seniors because they play the most. Now granted, they should have apparently uh, they should have the, uh, the cheapest cost, um, but they also have the ability to play the most rounds. So you have to look at that as well. There's, so to even answer your question a little bit uh, wider is that it's, these are just costs for the memberships, yeah. not for um, all the other rounds of golf that we sell. Seniors also need the most exercise and are limited income, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I agree, they should be out there more often. Um, and there's other ways that they can exercise as well, but I think using golf uh, 
and if, if they didn't use a cart. So that's the thing also. But we want them to use a cart because we so make that's money. That's your plan. That's why we're not replacing <laughs> these golf carts. They see this guy. <laughs> yeah. But if, uh, yeah, if they're not walking, they're not getting the exercise that they need. Uh, but we want them to use carts because we make money off of that. So, yeah. Um, One thing I'll say, and I've been saying this the entire time, is we need to at some point stop subsidizing um, for the for quality golf and experience. Um, we're losing we're losing tournaments and golfers uh, right now because, and these aren't my words. It's somebody that was uh, told me this this weekend that um, they just don't want to play on dirt dirt fairways. So. Um, at some point, we're going to have to come to a crossroads and, and find that sweet spot um, because right now we, we are subsidizing a little bit um, for the, the quality of the golf courses. Um, and I don't want to get to a point again. I went through it, we went through it three or four years ago um, with Clap Park. And I don't want to get to a point where we're having to make a decision, a tough decision, and um, sit down and, and lose another one of our, our great golf courses because we have tremendous bones here in Wichita. I think um, each each golf course and the, the experience that each one provides is different. Uh, I mean, I I can potentially see Auburn Hills hosting um, national collegiate and um, national AJGA tournaments um, out there. Um, you know, Mac Park has history, um, and you know, if you're kind of a golf nerd like me. Um, you know, going out there and, and understanding some of the nuances of, of that park. Um, you know, Sim is great for beginners. Tex is kind of our cash cow that everybody likes to play. I love the layout down there. Um, so we've got really good bones. I just don't want to get to a point where uh, we have to sit down and, and have that discussion again because three or four years ago that was no fun. So that's what I'd say on that. Okay. Park maintenance. While they're getting that uh, set up, I, I do want to um, throw out there that elections are coming up for this board. Um, so if you would like to nominate yourself or somebody else, uh, I think we'll put that on the agenda for next month. But um, if anybody has a burning desire to uh, be the next chair or president, um, I've served the last couple of years and um, I'm ready to pass the torch a little bit. So. I'm sure you guys are sick of hearing from me as well. So um, I'd like to uh, throw that out there. I think, you know, everyone on this board would be a tremendous uh, chairman and, and president. Um, but if somebody wants to throw their name in the hat, now would be the time. Um, we'll vote on it next month. To add to that, um, uh, Troy Palmer served and uh, Tori served as well so just to let you know that yeah. i nominate alejo i don't know about all that <laughs> what's that <laughs> i said i don't know about all that <laughs> well we can cross no. that bridge i just want to no. put that out there well we appreciate the nomination thank no. you so one thing i would like to add about the discussion about filling positions when we got our approval back in september when they ratified the budget um, in park maintenance, we have enough people that want to try to move up, so we concentrated on giving everybody a chance to move up into a higher level position. And so we had a lot of internal interviews, and we had a lot of positions move, but that doesn't bring new people in. So now, here in January, February, and March, we've worked on actually trying to put new bodies into those positions and they're the lower level positions, which starts out at the minimum wage, and we're struggling uh, to fill those positions because everybody can make 18 to $20 an hour in, in different kind of jobs now. Um, our starting pay is, is at the high 14 to $15 an hour, 
for entry level park maintenance is hard to get people in those positions. So we're struggling a bit now to fill positions, but we have all of our positions posted and, and we're, we're trying to do interviews and, and fill positions. And I think uh, this next budget process, we're gonna get to fill a few more positions. So um, our efforts are gonna be really strong in trying to get positions filled by uh, here the 1st of June. So, so anyway, just thought I would share that. Uh, so there's some production numbers for um, our, our forestry work there. Uh, you can see that that's that tree that was in question over there uh, by the museum that um, uh, a lot of controversy uh, occurred. And so um, that tree has a big old split. It was really ready to go. There's a, there was a nasty split right down through there. So it really was at the end of slide, but it created a lot of controversy. But um, you can see uh, the bottom deal, we've been concentrating on planting our trees. I, I talked about it last time I gave my report. So uh, we've planted 1,300 trees to date. Uh, I think we have about 240 trees left out of our 1,500 trees. So we've made an effort to plant trees. And I find it interesting to listen to that conversation, the narrative about that. You know, they talk about uh, removing five to 7,000 trees and and we're only planting this many trees. When we do our windshield survey, we drive around and look, we probably, we, we need to be removing 20,000 trees a year. Uh, there's enough dead and dying trees that we should be moving, removing about 20,000, so our resources aren't even close to the amount of resources we need to plant trees, and our resources aren't anywhere near enough for what we should be doing to maintain trees. Um, Troy mentioned that ratio of how many trees we touch each year. Yeah, we're, we're, we're on a 30 to 50 year rotation on, on pruning trees. So we have all these uh, dead and dying trees and we have trees that need to be pruned and, and we're not even close to those numbers, but it's good that we have a narrative and a discussion started about all of that. So uh, in, our, in, in my division, we really have to balance that. You know, we can't just spend all of our time planting trees because we have all these requests for prunings. I, I think I've mentioned more than once that we have over 3,000 individual requests for, from people to come and prune their trees in their front yards, you know. Uh, we really have thousands and thousands of trees that need to be pruned uh, before they become even more dangerous than they are. So I just wanted to kind of point that out, but um, those are production numbers there. Uh, we've had several tailgate meetings uh, on stuff, uh, inspections for contract tree removal at the golf courses. I think we're, uh, I think that is pretty much done. Uh, it reports there 75%, but we, we spent our $250,000 this year on just trying to concentrate on golf courses, knowing that something could happen with them. We wanted the trees to be in good shape. So we concentrated all that uh, contracted tree removal money uh, on the golf courses. The golf courses are in a lot better shape today uh, for doing that. Um, um, there again, it says uh, focus has been uh, continued on planting trees. Some removals and stump grinding uh, will be required um, to, prior to planting. Um, we had a fair amount of cold weather, you know, storms and freezing weather have affected uh, progress on planting. Uh, there, uh, March was cold, February was cold. So when it gets that cold, it's, it's hard to plant trees, but uh, we've got after it and we'll be done here probably by the end of April, I'll bet. So there, I just put a little another highlight there. Planting trees almost done, we've got 240 left. So uh, April schedule activities is, ER responses as needed. Uh, we did have a fair amount of work to do with all these wind storms we've had lately. We're going to continue with inspections. Contractor removal is, is about to get done. Uh, we haven't had very many uh, ABCD inspections. Um, Arbor Day is coming up, so we have a plan for Arbor Day, um, which is the last Friday of the month. I don't know, 26th, 27th, somewhere in there. Um, we're still 
That's, I see my note on there about planning uh, uh, Swanson's Park tree clearing because we're gonna to try to put in that pedestrian bridge out there. Well, the bid on the pedestrian bridge come in way high. It's like really high. So uh, we're gonna to have to rethink all that and see what we can do to come up with funding to, to actually do the project. Uh, but we're trying to get out in front of that and talk to the community about, hey, we're gonna to have to cut a path through there, which is going to require us to remove trees, um, so uh, be prepared. Um, but man, since the cost of the project is so high, you know, it, it's going to slow that down. We got to figure out how to pay for 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 the project. So our construction and spatial projects group. Um, they do a lot of work and we send them all over the place, um, you know, with all the funding that uh, uh, Reggie's group has gotten to, uh, for the rec centers. We're, we're trying to help them put together all that equipment, move that equipment in and out uh, of the buildings. Uh, we just have a ton of graffiti stuff uh, that we uh, have to do, uh, demolished and disposed of some uh, broken pool and, and foosball tables at the Edgemoor regular vulgar gang racist graffiti out there uh, required fencing outside of the tennis center that was damaged uh, we just just uh, this group just goes about anywhere troy calls me to send them to or i call i send them to they they take care of a, a lot of different things and their biggest focus is on playgrounds you, you know they do a lot of inspection on playgrounds so uh, their biggest effort is is uh, trying to make sure our playgrounds stay safe. A lot of stuff up there. Brett does a nice job with his crew. Scheduled activities, demolish and dispose of the asphalt uh, basketball court at Boston Park has been replaced. So uh, I think we have three basketball courts, College Hill, Boston, I can't think of the third one. Uh, Harrison, yeah, uh, maybe. So we, um, you know, we uh, did some of the work, did some of the demolition on it. Um, trying to see what other important, we got some sway benches at Grand's Parents Park uh, that we're trying to get in. Um, a lot of this stuff is just not really important, but it's stuff that we do. Um, continued playground safety inspections, response to graffiti and vandalism there at the bottom. I found this picture interesting this month. Uh, that that uh, homeless encampment right there, um, they had 6,000 pounds worth of material piled into that, that tent. And it's amazing how fast they can build this stuff, but all up and down the river between like, um, uh, they're at, um, West Side Athletic Field, McLean Boulevard, that goes up north to 13th Street. Uh, there's just a bun of, bunch of homeless uh, in there. And you know, you, you break them down, you, you ask, the hot team ask them to move on. You can see that green sign right there. That's their, they're being posted. They're being posted that they have 72 hours to move uh, their camp. And so, They'll plan that out, and a lot of them are so good at it, they just move up the river a little ways and reestablish. But in some instances, they do go ahead and just vacate all the stuff that they've gathered up. But uh, it was uh, three tons of trash come out of that encampment right there. And, and it's bigger than that. It goes a couple of different directions. But, um, that's some of the stuff that we just have to deal with. So the athletic crews are continuing to prep for uh, league play. Matter of fact, league play has already started. Uh, we've got softball going on. Noxious Swedes there, they've been uh, applying pre-emergent uh, for the sand burrs and puncture vine uh, in all the places that we, we need to do that. Uh, assisting the athletic crew on days that it's not fit for spraying all these windy days. That crew can't be out there working, so we, we have them do other stuff. Uh, retain maintenance there. Uh, we've done a lot of work over A. Price Woodard Park along the riverbank. I think I showed some pictures of us removing the sod. Uh, we'll be sodding that back in here next month. Um, 
Nafsker Park, the overseeding of that lawn area. We're, we're trying to make it look as good as we can this summer, uh, you know, just to get through until we can put the artificial turf down. So we, we have been trying to do some overseeding over there, but man, when they built that park, they compacted the ground so hard, um, our, our aerator just barely pulled half inch uh, spikes out of it. It was horrible. Um, We've been brooming bike paths, uh, city hall landscaping. I don't, if you've noticed, we've done some work around here, and yes, we're trying to replant some stuff out there on the north side to make it look better. Um, uh, all this material that's been planted around here is 20 plus years old, and it's starting to look that way, so we're trying to replace some of that. Working on homeless camp cleanups. Uh, Irrigation, they, they worked on a project out there at the Harrison Dog Park. Um, just trying to get all the systems up and running, backflow flow preventers put in place, that kind of stuff. Um, contracted grounds maintenance will be kicking in. Um, so all of the folks that we hire to do mowing, uh, they have been assigned their first rounds of work orders. So we're, we're issuing work orders like crazy. Mr. Hauptman will be presenting um, um, tomorrow. tomorrow, yes, tomorrow, um, we're, we're, we're giving them a, um, that says 4%, there's really a 3% fuel sh surge charge, uh, there's, that's a, an error, that should be 3%, um, because the vendors, they put their bid in back in 2020, and gasoline was $2.20, and I think it got to a high of $2.60, and now gas is at the level it is now. Well, that's really kind of puts them to an unfair advantage. If all of our vendors were to say, I want to cancel my contract, which they have a 30 day out, if half of those, if, if a third of them um, turn their contracts back in, we would be in trouble. Um, we, we don't have the resource to pick up and just take over uh, mowing and so forth. So we're presenting that they get a 3% fuel charge on every work order uh, when the gas is above $3.40, and Mr. Houtman will be presenting that tomorrow to City Council. Refuge uh, is uh, working with a lot of illegal dumpings. Um, uh, we did get approved to replace our uh, trash truck, so we're getting two new trash trucks sometime this year, uh, which will be huge because our track trucks were down uh, every month, and which was killing time. You know, we weren't uh, getting, getting our work done. So uh, with two new trash trucks, uh, that will be a huge help in, in uh, running our routes and keeping the trash uh, picked up as best we can. So I think that concludes my presentation. So. I'll stand for any questions you might have. Any questions for David? Dave, do you know how much, would you be able to provide an estimate on how much money we spend removing graffiti and replacing damaged places? Yeah, I can work on that. I could pull that together. Um, yeah. we, we, we use the Lucidy work order system. Yeah. And uh, so anytime we do any work on graffiti, it, it should go to that and we should be able to query that and pull that information. Yeah, I've talked about that many, many times is that we don't have a line item in our budget to address uh, vandalism, graffiti, and as of lately, burned down playgrounds. <laughs> so, so what happens when, that, when those things happen is that we have to pull those resources from other things. So uh, we plant less trees, we have less staff to take care of all of our landscaping, um, you know, so it's getting worse and worse. Um, you know, the issue in regards to the homeless encampments, it's, it's not just an issue in regards to us cleaning them. There's a much larger discussion that needs to be uh, out there in regards to how do we take care of them? What do we need to do to help them uh, move on to be more successful in life? And, and some of them, can't or won't. There's a lot of different aspects to homelessness. Um, it's a very big, big and important topic. It's not just about what you just saw on, on the screen and what we deal with, but unfortunately, we have um, in, been impacted by it and impacted by it very, uh, very strongly. It has a huge impact. 
uh, when we go out there and clean them, it, it's not very the most sanitary location. I can, I'll, I'll save you the, the details. But also issues in regards to needles and other types of dangers as well. So our staff has to deal with that. And, um, and I don't think it's necessarily fair or right, but there's other things that have to be addressed way, way beyond just what we have to deal with at the very end of, and this is kind of like the very end of the dominoes. There's a lot of other things that happen way above that that have an impact on this. And so um, I know that's always a big discussion on a much higher level and a bigger plane, but I just wanted to put my two cents. I, I might piggyback on that and share that just last week, Reggie and I attended a meeting. Uh, the city is creating a task force to start talking about the homeless situation at a whole different level. Um, and so uh, we just touched on it for 45 minutes to an hour of, of uh, what's ahead of us. And, and so there is a task force uh, getting put together by the city to try to start leading the charge on that effort. Thanks, David. Parks Foundation. Uh, I don't have an update. I, uh, I haven't received an email from We haven't had a meeting. Uh, we didn't cancel the last meeting that we had, so there's really no updates. Um, the big thing is uh, red, white, and boom, uh, fireworks, and so we're moving forward with that. We, we did get um, another $15,000 from um, Freddy's, that's right, nice. yeah. Did they give us ice cream? No. Custard. Custard, yeah. <laughs> no correct. Yeah. Custard, sorry, Freddy. <laughs> Um, President's update, just a quick update on the uh, golf marathon. Um, donations, I think I saw today, were just under 10,000. Uh, we're a week away, and I'll check the weather, and it, for lack of a better term, it looks like it sucks next Monday, so I'm going to be bundled up playing a bunch of, bunch of golf. Um, that 10,000 number doesn't include some of the sponsors, um, so we're a little bit closer to that 25,000 number goal that we uh, we have set um, than it appears, but um, certainly this will be a big push this week to try to get to that number. It sounds like um, Corey Novascone uh, informed me that um, junior golf rounds are beginning to be comped. Uh, he gets an email everybody every time somebody checks into that. Um, however they do it with the QR code or whatever. So he gets emails and um, so they are being used. Um, so hopefully we can raise a, a lot of money to, uh, to continue to comp those rounds for the, for the juniors because we talk about accessibility and affordability um, for, for everybody uh, to play golf. And um, you know, it's presented a lot of opportunities in my life and um, you know, my friends' lives and uh, wanna afford that opportunity to to some of these kids as well. So I um, want to uh, thank everybody for, um, you know, uh, donating and um, sharing the, the good word. Um, and it should be a fun Monday next week. Director, help me. Yeah, just a couple things. <clears throat> um, we're going to be hosting the Kansas Recreation and Park Association State Conference in 2024, and that's usually at the beginning of February. So um, that's kind of cool. And then uh, I talked to you about this, um, about uh, serving on the selection committee for golf. And so I, I'm, I'm making, I'll, that, I'll, making that suggestion. <laughs> I'll give you my answer uh, sometime this week. Okay, so, right. so if you don't, then you have to find somebody for your replacement. Fair okay. enough. And then I need somebody on the aquatics um, director's position. Um, so that will be a position that's in charge of all of our pools and splash pads, filling Brian Hill's vacancy. So um, if somebody would like to volunteer to be on that selection committee, I would appreciate it. What is your time, what's the time requirement on that? A lot. <laughs> um, so like I mentioned, I think we have four candidates that we want to review. We're probably going to, we'll do a staff um, uh, teams meeting or a, a Zoom meeting with them and, and bring it down to three. 
So we'll probably have three candidates that we're going to interview. They'll probably be about an hour, 15 minutes a piece. Uh, so the time commitment is probably about four hours. Um, I'm hoping to do that uh, not next week, but the following week. Um, so yeah, that, that'll probably be the last week of April. We really need to get these people on, or this particular person on board. So. I've already nominated you once today, so I'll be nice and... <laughs> I, I mean, I can do it. I used to swim. <laughs> I did, I used to swim. For fun oh, or okay. survival? No, 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 <laughs> both. Uh, but no, I, I mean, if nobody else wants to do it, do it. I'd be happy to help. There it is. All right, there you go. So it's a pretty important position, so I really wanted to get somebody from the park board. Yeah. So thank you. So when we make our final um, interview, we'll make sure he's on the committee, so. All right, thank you, that's all I got. Thanks guys, um, if there's nothing else that needs to be addressed today or put on the agenda for next month, uh, we can adjourn. Don't forget to uh, get your parking pass. Yes.